Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to the video. And be sure to hit the bell notification when you do so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video out, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. These days, I usually have several videos out a week. Hope you enjoy this. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kellett, your host. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. And I got to I, I love a good open forum Thursday when we get Jimmy for both hours. And especially when I have had a, uh, you know, a week where I've survived. Uh, uh, and I, and I, this is, you know, I, I survived. And uh, you, an survi you, you survived the, you survived the eclipse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't do the substitute king ritual with you. <laughs> No, wait. I think I know what that is. But is that, mm -hmm. is that the one, like, I think it was ancient Mesopotamia or something where, like, they, they know mm -hmm. the eclipse is coming and that you got to kill the king. And so they they make some poor guy king for the day. Congratulations. Yeah. Do I have the basic story it, right? It, it, basics, yeah. Now, it it's connected with uh, Babylonian planetary omens. Um, they didn't do astrology like we do. Uh, you know, today astrologers will calculate where the planets are going to be and make a prediction on that basis. And they didn't do that in ancient Mesopotamia. It, incidentally, it was Mesopotamia where they invented the zodiac. Uh, and we can tell that from a variety of factors, but we can tell that's where they invented it. Um, but what they would do is they would wait to see something happening in the sky, and then they would say, okay, we're going to make a prediction based on that. So they didn't do projective astrology where they uh. projected what was going to happen. They did reactive astrology where they reacted to what they were seeing in the sky. One of the <clears> – <throat> uh, a lot of the omens actually deal with the planet Jupiter, which was the, you know, the king of the planets, and it has a connection with royalty. And so um, one of them was, if you see Jupiter do this, then it means the king is going to die. So what they would do, and it was it, also this is connected with eclipses, and um, and so what what they would do is they would find a condemned prisoner and make him king. And they'd dress him in the royal robes, and they would let him live in the palace and all this kind of stuff. As Gilbert and Sullivan might say, he would live for a month as a fighting cock. You know, he's, he's, he's the top he's dog. Being given, <laughs> given the royal treatment. And, um, and then, at the same time, the previous king would be not living in the palace and he would be <laughs> like living in an ordinary dwelling and he's referred to in all the official documents as the farmer you know because we're making it <laughs> really it. clear to the gods now <laughs> he's just this, a farmer that, oh, he's he's a farmer he's not the king now the new king is this new guy and then since he's a condemned criminal then well problem solved at the end of the period the king dies and then the farmer becomes the king again i guess there's a lot of ways to go if you're a condemned criminal this is not a bad way to go all in all i mean if you're gonna no, if you're gonna be condemned it, criminal it, it, yeah it's basically what uh, coco proposes to uh nanky poo in the mikado Oh yeah, that's <laughs> that is right. <laughs> uh, you know that could they tell when an eclipse was coming though, or was their math not up to up, that task? Up to up to a point, Lord Copper. Uh, mm -hmm. They knew that eclipses occur on seventeen-year cycles, and so they could tell when a cycle was coming up. But the issue is, it doesn't happen every time in in these cycles so the cycles that they identified would tell you there's likely to be an eclipse mm -hmm. but not that it's certain that there's going to be an eclipse ah okay well we had 58 percent eclipse here and i thought mm. if nobody told you there was an eclipse you wouldn't even look up you like you wouldn't have yeah i i think 42 percent of the sun is still extremely powerful because you wouldn't notice any deviation yeah, it, it really, you have to get close to totality before the light starts to be noticeably different than what it is normally. Yeah. And then when totality happens, it changes in less than a minute. The sky goes completely dark and it's very fast. And then totality will last, say, four minutes if you're directly under it. And, um, and then as soon, and you can use, you know, the special 
you know, protective glasses to look at the sun and you'll see, oh, wow, it's almost entirely covered and it's still broad daylight. But then as soon as totality happens, it instantly becomes dark. Oh. And the reverse happens on, on the other side of totality. I was filming this uh, yesterday. I put the video on Facebook if, if people want to look it up. Um, but uh i i was i was in i drove down to russellville arkansas so i would be in the totality zone and i was filming it and as soon as totality is over as soon as there's just a little sliver mm -hmm. of the sun peeking out from behind the moon again it that it that blaze just washes over you can't hardly see the moon for more than a few seconds wow. and it looks like it's a full sun up there even though it's not just because of how bright that sliver is Wow, that is really something. Because I, 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 that is really something. I, I've never seen a full eclipse. I, I, I know that mm -hmm. I've seen. I know back in the seventies, uh, we didn't have mylar glasses then. You had to like reflect it on Do a reflect. Yeah, yeah, on a piece of cardboard or something. Yeah, but so I remember yeah. seeing it then. And then uh, yesterday, uh, Bernadette had glasses, so uh, we went outside mm -hmm. and we looked up, and. Um, uh, but I've never seen the full thing. I, I would, I'd be interested to see it. It's very interesting to see. Uh, the sky basically goes black like it is at night, except there is a white ring hanging in the sky because of the That's corona weird. of the sun peeking out from behind the moon. Uh, well, I'm glad we all survived it. And I didn't have to be the substitute king while the farmer uh, took a little vacation on his farm. Yeah. By the way, speaking of people uh, who don't get executed in conjunction with eclipses, yeah. one of them is Jesus. Sometimes people try to explain the darkness during the crucifixion as a solar eclipse. Right. Wrong. Uh, solar eclipses cannot occur at Passover because Passover is the full moon. Oh, yeah. That means the the near face of the moon is fully visible. Therefore, it is not between us and the sun. Uh, however, there was a lunar eclipse that night in Jerusalem. Oh, there was. Oh, mm -hmm. that's just a weird fact. Because that then that was. Let me let me get this right. The thirty A.D. In all likelihood, correct. Thirty three. Oh, thirty three A.D. Thirty three. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, off we go uh, to the not to the phones, but to the internet. This one came from John. Does your guardian angel leave you when you die? Well, the truth is we don't know. Um, there are a number of possibilities here. It could be as soon as uh, you, your heart stops, your guardian angel punches his pay clock and heads for the door. On the other hand, you might have more than a real, more than some additional contact with him. Uh, one of the things that we read about in um, in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man is that angels appeared and escorted Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. So that actually syncs up with various deathbed vision and near-death experiences that people have had where people uh, figures appear to them either before just before they die or even after their heart is stopped um, figures appear to them and escort them to the next life and these figures sometimes are angels uh, sometimes they're departed loved ones, um, but uh, it does sync up with what Jesus said in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man that would suggest angels do this at least some of the time. Incidentally, um, I, I find it interesting, there was a study done a number of years ago of uh, deathbed visions, both in, a, in the United States and in India. And in India, the the messengers that come for you at your death are called yamduts. And so Christians or people in America would say, oh, the angels are coming to take me to the afterlife. And the uh -huh. um, Indians would say, oh, I see a yamdut at the end of my bed. <laughs> and, and in uh -huh. Indian uh, belief, if you've lived a good life, it's a pleasant yamdut that shows up for you. But if you've been naughty rather than nice, a fearsome yamdut will show up for you. And some of them would report fearsome yamdut showing up. Um, in any event, your guardian angel might be one of the angels that escorts you or one of the afterlife guides that escorts you to the next life. So you might have a continuing relationship with him at least until you get to heaven. Or you might have a longer relationship with him. He might be your afterlife buddy. 
you know, you, he spent all this time working on you on Earth. He may be interested in hanging out with you in the afterlife. He might also get reassigned to one person or even multiple people at the same time. Because, you know, as long as he's able to adequately guard somebody, it doesn't matter how whether he has one person he's adequately guarding or a bunch of people he's adequately guarding. And maybe, so maybe angels multitask and, you know, maybe both of those things happen. Maybe he gets to be your afterlife buddy, but he's also, you know, looking out for some other people too. John, thank you very much. Uh, hope I hope I never see the angry yam dude. Uh, the, yeah. <laughs> no, you don't want that. It'd be like an angry angel showing up to take you to purgatory or somewhere worse. But the, but the, but the, in India, so the yam dude is understood as a spirit though. As, as some kind yes, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. they're they're like our angels. Yeah. Uh, thanks, John. Well, that'll bring us to the break. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with more open forum of the internet variety with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Your questions, Catholic Answers Live. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. The EWTN On Demand platform features 50 new podcasts every week, as well as an ever-expanding library of audio and video content. For Catholics who want to learn more about their faith, simply using their mobile device, computer, or TV. Your favorite EWTN programs are available 24-7. Visit EWTN.com and click On Demand. EWTN is the Global Catholic Network. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I am Cy Kelly, your host, Jimmy Akins, our guest. It's Open Forum. And again, I will invite you uh, uh, to consider coming to the Catholic Answers Conference. We're going to talk about Jesus, about the parables and sayings of Jesus. Uh, lots of wonderful people will be there. Among them will be uh, Scott and Kimberly Hahn and Jimmy Aiken, who you are listening to uh, right now, uh, giving a, a, a wonderful variety of talks. It's become a tradition we do at the last full weekend of September right here in San Diego. Check it out at CatholicAnswersConference.com. Catholic Answers Conference. Dot com. Jimmy Ken wants to know this. What are some good mm. research tools and or websites for researching paranormal experiences? Well, um, <clears throat> so I guess the first thing I'll do is mention what you shouldn't look at. And in general, what you shouldn't look at is ghost hunting shows on TV because they're junk. Uh, there are basically no good, competent ghost hunting shows. Um, also, lots of New Age books are written on this stuff, and a lot of them are junk, too. Um, I would say now there's – so what, what he says, um, what Ken says is researching paranormal experiences. And research gets done on paranormal experiences in two ways. Um one way is by investigating accounts of individual ex spontaneous experiences in the field. Like if someone thinks there's a ghost or a poltergeist in their house, or they have a spontaneous premonition of what's going to happen in the future. And so um, that's one way. That's one kind of research is field research. Another kind of research is laboratory research, where you have an organized way of trying to study typically multiple experiences. Either you're aggregating reports of field experiences and and seeing what can be learned about them in general, even though you're not focusing on just one, um, or you're running laboratory tests where you have multiple trials and you see, can we get someone to manifest precognition in the lab or manifest telepathy in the lab or manifest psychokinesis in the lab? So um, you, it, it depends on what kind of research in paranormal experiences that Ken is interested in learning about, because there are these two major types, field research and lab research. Um, in terms of a single resource that is very uh, competent, very respected, and takes a very scientific approach to a lot of this, I would recommend the Rhine Education Center. Um, 
That's R H I N E, Rhine, like the river. Um, J. B. Rhine was a uh, the most famous American parapsychologist in the 20th century. He worked at Duke University, and when he retired, he he created a foundation that continues his work. And these days, the um, the Rhine has an education center where they teach online classes. You can go to R H I N E E D U dot org to learn about those classes. In fact, I'm going to be, I'm a teacher at the Rhine and uh, just next month, I'm going to be teaching an eight week class in May and June that is an introduction to parapsychology where I talk about both lab research and field research and all the different concepts that parapsychology involves. So if you're interested in taking that, uh, go to rhineedu.org and you can sign up. Um, the classes are online. Also, one of the other major instructors at uh, at the Rhine Education Center is a gentleman named Lloyd Auerbach, and he focuses on field investigations. So he's like ghost hunting, only done right. Mm -hmm. um, and he also teaches a bunch of courses, uh, principally about field investigations at the Rhine. And if you want to have a print resource, uh, I would suggest Lloyd's book, Ghost Hunting, How to Investigate the Paranormal. So that's Lloyd Auerbach, A-U-E-R-B-A-C-H, Lloyd Auerbach, Ghost Hunting, How to Investigate the Paranormal. And that will give you a competent uh, look at the subject. And I know some of the things Lloyd stresses, because I've taken his classes and I have his books, is you always look at the normal explanations first because they're the most likely to be true in a given case. And even in a case where it looks like something genuinely paranormal is happening, there are often aspects of it that are natural, that mm. are not paranormal. And um, sometimes, even if the case looks really weird, it may actually all be normal. And there may be normal explanations for all of the weird stuff that seems to be happening. All right. Uh, uh, Ken, thank you very much. Appreciate the, the question. And on we oh, we got time. I go to Charlie. Charlie's next. Uh, Charlie asks this, Jimmy. we got loads of time till the next break. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, yeah. It, it, they redid the studio a little bit, and I have to kind of look around something to see the clock. Uh, if the priest mm -hmm. has an accident, for example, spills the host and or wine such that it is not salvageable, before, mid, or after consecration, how would this affect the rest of the Mass? If the priest would simply consecrate again, would the procedure change if there's no more host and or wine to consecrate? Hmm. Okay, so uh, there's actually a, a document that the Church wrote that deals with all of this. Uh, it's it's the short title of it is De Defectibus, which means on defects. The longer title is like on defects occurring in the celebration of the Mass. And it's part of the older Roman Missal, the one that's used in traditional Latin Masses today. Uh, for some reason, when they did a revision of the liturgy, they didn't do a new version of De Defectibus, but it's a great document. Um, it covers all kinds of scenarios for if this defect happens, here's what you do. If this defect happens, here's what you do. It covers things like, suppose the priest is saying, uh, has consecrated the wine and a spider falls in it. What do you do? You know, um, or suppose it's, it's wintertime and the priest consecrates the the wine and then it turns out it's frozen <laughs> how do you deal with frozen wine you know yeah. or suppose he consecrates the host and it bounces and a mouse carries it off you know it's got all these interesting detailed scenarios um so you can look up de defectibus for more but um if one or both of the elements become inedible for whatever reason then the priest is directed to consecrate new materials. So if the host, if all the hosts become inedible for some reason, he's supposed to consecrate new hosts. If all the wine becomes inedible, maybe because it was spilled, then um, he's supposed to consecrate new wine. To the extent possible, De Defectibus says, he should do this quietly so as not to alarm the faithful 
Um, but if if he publicly just knocked over the wine and everybody saw it spill, there's not much you can do. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you you obviously want to attend to the wine that has been spilled, but then you want to get new wine and consecrate that. And there's no point in doing that secretly. In fact, you'd want to do the opposite so people could see that you have consecrated this wine. Um, if there is no new material to consecrate, then since all – since mass requires the consecration of both then you in essence suspend the mass if it's um if there is a possibility though of going and getting more material you suspend it only temporarily until you can go get um some new material and consecrate that all right. Uh, De Defectibus. Uh, Charlie, thanks. Thanks very much for the question. Fred wants to know this. Let us make man in our own image. Who is us and our? Is this an er- early indication of the Blessed Trinity? Yeah, so this comes up periodically. One of the options that people sometimes ask about here is, is this a situation where God is using the royal we? You know, which is where a an individual monarch uses the plural pronoun. So, like, famously and probably apocryphally, Queen Victoria said, "We are not amused," meaning I am not amused. Well, a lot of monarchs do that, and popes historically have done that. They don't tend to these days, but historically they have. And um, so, God is depicted as a king. And maybe he's using the royal we here. That's one possibility. Except it's not, because the royal we only exists in some languages, like English and Latin. It does not exist in Hebrew. There are no royal we's in Hebrew. So we know God is talking to someone, whoever the speaker is here, the divine speaker is talking to a different person. And uh, Fred's question is, is it one of the other members of the Trinity? Well, um, maybe, but we have a, ch- a we have a difficulty with that view, which is that the Trinitarian understanding of the of the Godhead had not yet been revealed at the time the Book of Genesis was written, and therefore, since the literal meaning of a text is what the human author intended it to mean it's unlikely that the human author would have had a Trinitarian understanding of God. Now, God has a Trinitarian understanding of himself, so uh, there can be a Trinitarian meaning in the spiritual sense of the text, which includes what God intended the text to communicate. But in terms of its literal sense, it is improbable that the human author had a Trinitarian understanding of the Godhead. Although, I would note that there are passages in the Old Testament that to some Jews in the Second Temple period suggested that there was more than one divine figure in heaven, that you had Yahweh and then a second figure that was sometimes called the lesser Yahweh or the second Yahweh, and this is today referred to as the two powers in heaven doctrine. And hypothetically, if the author of Genesis was aware of the two powers in heaven concept, then he might have envisioned Um, the first person of the Trinity, the greater Yahweh, talking to the second person of of the Trinity, the second Yahweh. That would be possible in the literal sense, but it's quite speculative since we're trying to read the mind of a man who lived a thousand years before the time of Jesus. Um, A safer literal interpretation, and this is the one that I think more biblical scholars would go to, is that what the author is doing is a kind of associative we, where God is talking to the other members of his heavenly council, which we would call angels, and he's saying to them, let's make man in our image. Now, he's planning on making man himself, Um, he's planning on doing all the work, but he's associating them with his plan, um, which is why you would you could call this an associative we. It's kind of like if I was planning on ordering pizza for dinner for me and Cy Kellett, I might say to Cy, hey, Cy, let's get pizza tonight, in which case I'm planning on doing all the work. I'm going to order the pizza. I'm going to pay for the pizza, but I'm associating Cy with my plan to uh, order pizza, even though I'm the one doing the actual work. 
Uh, thank you very much. I, I know it ended with pizza, so I got distracted at the end. But, Fred, uh, thanks very much <laughs> for the question. Uh, this one comes from Frank. Why didn't the Pharaoh at the time of Moses, being a firstborn, die during the 10th plague? Okay, well, the first thing to say is they had very high infant mortality rates uh, in the ancient world, and consequently, a lot of pharaohs were not firstborn. They, the firstborn would die for any number of reasons, and then, um, then one of his younger sons would take the throne. And there usually wasn't a problem getting a younger son to do that because they also practiced polygamy, and some of them had enormous numbers of sons. Um, in this case, the, the, far, the Pharaoh at the time of Moses, or during the, during the Exodus experience, appears to have been Ramesses II. And in looking into Ramesses' family, it looks like he was a firstborn. And so since he didn't die, I would conclude there was likely an age cutoff. Once you were over a certain age and you were a household head, you didn't die. Also, they needed him still alive to give the let go order. So for both of those reasons, I would suggest that's why he didn't die. Thanks, Frank. Break time. We'll take a quick break right back with more Internet Open Forum with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. When it comes to Catholic teachings about Mary, there's one question we hear more than any other. Where is that in the Bible? The answer, everywhere. In Bible Mary, the mother of Jesus and the Word of God, Father John Weiss opens Scripture to reveal a Mary who has been hiding in plain sight. Father Weiss discloses the new Eve foretold in the Old Testament and revealed in the New. Order your copy of Bible Mary today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. When the resurrected Jesus appeared to disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until the breaking of the bread. The same is true today. In the Holy Eucharist, we really meet Jesus. In The Eucharist is Really Jesus, author Joe Heschmeyer explains how knowing Jesus in the Eucharist is the key to understanding all of Christian faith. Order your copy of The Eucharist is Really Jesus today at shop.catholic.com or get it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Are you scared to talk about abortion? Don't worry, almost everyone is. You can overcome this fear as Trent Horn shows in the newly revised and expanded second edition of Persuasive Pro-Life. With a little knowledge and a few proven techniques, you can become a bold and effective apologist for life. Visit shop.catholic.com to order your copy of Persuasive Pro-Life and never again be afraid to speak up. Also available at good Catholic bookstores. Is orthodoxy an alternative to the Catholic Church? In a time of uncertainty for many Catholics, orthodoxy can look like greener pastures. Answering Orthodoxy, the new book from Catholic Answers Press, explains why Catholics who are thinking of leaving need to think twice. There are important reasons to remain in the Catholic Church and convincing answers to orthodox claims. Order your copy of Answering Orthodoxy today at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. A beacon is a light and will shine it on God's Word. I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and I invite you to join me tomorrow for Beacon of Truth on most of these EWTN stations. Now back to Catholic Answers Live with Cy Kellett. A little bit of groovy music. Look at that. It's a Thursday. Jimmy Aikens here. There's a little groovy music. I don't even know what could make this better. What could possibly make this better? Maybe a visit from Thomas the TikTok engine uh, to ask a question from Tik from TikTok. Hello, Thomas. Hi, Cy. Glad I can make your day better. Uh, it, and you, as as you generally do, uh, TikTok is still a thing, huh? It is so far. Seems like uh, the next attempt to ban it has turned into a nothing burger yet again. So uh, yeah, we'll wait and see. Uh, all right. Well, um, you got a question from TikTok for from TikTok for Jimmy. Uh, that's right. Uh, Jimmy, I've got this question that was a comment under one of our videos. This person was just asking in curiosity. They wanted to know, during his trial, why didn't Jesus try to stand up for himself? Pilate seemed like he would listen. Yeah, he didn't stand up for himself or respond to the charges that were being made against him because he didn't want to get off. He didn't want to be released from uh, from custody. He didn't want to be exonerated. He wanted to die for the sins of mankind on the cross. And so he deliberately 
provoked the Jewish authorities by clearing the temple and by acting in such a way that he knew they would come after him, and they did. And once that happened, uh, he was fulfilling the Father's plan, so he didn't want to be let off from uh, from the charges against him, even though even though they were false. He 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 was determined to go to the cross and offer his life in atonement for the sins of the world as a sacrifice of love. And if he defended himself, it might have thwarted that plan. So he was doing what was consistent with the plan. That's really interesting. Certainly not a situation that most of us can comprehend. I think. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I could comprehend the answer. Oh, sure, not sure. The situation. Sure, not, not standing there and, and, and <laughs> not defending myself. Yeah. Right. All right, well, uh, Thomas, that was a very efficient visit. That was. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Sai. All right, uh, see you soon. Maybe next time we'll see you, uh, there will be a new member of the TikTok family, because that's coming up soon, Very right? possibly. Yeah. All right, well, um, uh, pray for Mrs. We, we'll pray for Mrs. TikTok, and we'll ask for the, the listeners to as well, Teresa. Please uh, do. Please yeah. do. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, this next question, I, oh, um, this is from Ben. I have two, is what Ben says. I see. What does it mean when the church says that Mary's virginity remained intact during childbirth? Is this belief dogma? Well, the belief that Mary remained a virgin is a dogma. Um, she, that's, you know, she was a perpetual virgin throughout her life. The question is, what does that mean in physical terms when, for when she's giving birth to Christ. One proposal, and this has been the traditional understanding, is that God miraculously pres preserved her hymen uh, during the birth process so that it was not broken and she retained what you could call hymen virginity. Um, there are different ways that that could have happened. Uh, one way that has been commonly proposed is that Jesus basically teleported out of her womb. Uh, sometimes uh, various Catholic authors have compared it to light passing through a glass. And we even have in the uh, first century a report of at Jesus's birth, there was an enormous light, and then behold, there was the baby. He just like teleported out of the womb. And obviously, if that happened, then it wouldn't break the hymen. And so Mary would continue to have this hymen virginity, if you want to call it that. It's also possible God could have brought him out of the womb through the birth canal, but in a way that didn't, uh, didn't damage the hymen. However, the even though this is this kind of solution is the most normal one historically. Um, miraculous preservation of the hymen itself is not dogma. What's dogma is she remained virgin, um, not that her hymen was preserved. Contemporary theologians thus have thought in terms of other possibilities, and they tend to think of virginity as um, not a physical state, like having an intact hymen, but as, um, as the absence of having engaged in reproductive behavior. Um, you know, if someone has not engaged in reproductive behavior, then they're a virgin. And so it, whether or not they have an intact hymen doesn't really determine on this view whether they're a virgin or not, because it, virginity is not based on a physical structure. And as, as a, an, an argument in that direction, supporters of this view could point out that um, the hymen can be ruptured by things other than reproductive behavior, and that some women just have no hymen. So having an intact hymen is not necessary, is not necessary to be a virgin, and therefore, um, therefore uh, Mary need not have had a miraculous birth, even though there was, she did have a miraculous conception for her son. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, question, Ben. And I think this is what, is what he means by I have two. This is his second question uh, I'm gathering. Is it appropriate to worship— that, That's why there's a two in front of it. I got it. Is it appropriate to worship God in Mary due to theosis? If in heaven the saints are united to divine, divine nature in a similar way to Christ's hypostatic union, wouldn't it be appropriate to worship God in the glorified saints? I know it's not appropriate— but I just need help understanding the distinctions. Okay, so um, 
the saints are not hypostatically united to God. Um, hypostatic, a hypostatic union is where you become one person. So, for example, or actually, so it gets used actually differently, but the hypostatic union of Christ's two natures is his human nature and his divine nature is such that they form one person. It's not like there are two Christs, a human Christ and a divine Christ. There's just one person. Um, and so God, God's divinity is united to Christ in a unique way. It is not the way that God is united to the saints. So, um, so Mary is not God incarnate. Other saints are not God incarnate, only Jesus is God incarnate. And so because Jesus is God incarnate, it's appropriate to worship him as God, but it's not appropriate to worship others as God, except of course the Father and the whole and the Spirit. Um, now you could say, well, God is omnip is omnipresent. So he's obviously present in Mary and in other saints and in all of us here on earth in different ways. Um, and you can't and God can always be worshipped. So can you say, well, we should worship God in other people? And I think you can say that as long as you make sure that you're distinguishing between God and the person. We can worship God in places where he is including in in other people as long as you're worshiping god you're not worshiping the person so we can worship uh god in jesus but we can also worship jesus himself because he is god when it comes to mary we can worship god who is present in mary but we can't worship mary herself because she's not god all right uh thank you for both of those uh, questions uh, that was uh, Ben. Thank you, Ben, for both of those questions. It's Internet Open Forum. This one comes from Anthony. Uh, is there a definitive teaching or, or even different schools of speculation on whether or not your guardian angel is specifically assigned only to you? That is, the GA only, I like it, your GA, only ever served as your guardian for you? Or do they get different assignments when their guardies die? Asked another way, are there the same number of guardians as there are or have been or will be human beings? Or do the guardians guard different folks throughout their careers? Yeah, we touched on aspects of this previously on today's show, but the answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible that guardian angels have a series of assignments over time, so they, you know, will serve more than one person. It's also possible that they are serving more than one person concurrently. You know, uh, they they've got like they're like shepherds. They've got a little flock of people that they're caring for as long as they can adequately guard their charges. There's no reason they couldn't do more than one. Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities here. It's also possible that more than one angel is guarding us. You know, even if there's one regular angel, he might have associates, like a little group of shepherds that are helping him out. Um, we know mm -hmm. that we do have guardian angels. But frankly, we have to leave all these other questions. We can think about the possibilities, but frankly, we have to leave all of these other mysteries to God because he hasn't told us the answer. Uh, thanks, Anthony. I appreciate the question. That, that'll take us to the break. We'll take a quick break. Right back with oh, more. Yeah. I, and and I, should, I should mention Anthony's possibility is one of them, that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between guardians and humans. So the, the number of guardians and the number of humans are equal. Uh, okay. That's that another possibility. That would, it's, for some reason, I would find that motivating if that were the case. I should do better. If I got one guardian angel, I, I would like to make his job easier. Uh, or if, that, if he's just got one me, in other words. Anthony, thanks. We've got to take a break. We'll be right back with more Internet Open Forum with Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. Hang on. Catholic Answers Live will return in a moment. In Morse code, the sequence SOS is a distress call. It's been said that it stands for Save Our Souls. Well, right now our world is in big trouble and we're putting out an SOS call for help. Will you answer that call? St. Paul Street Evangelization, a Catholic nonprofit, has hundreds of teams who share the good news with souls who don't know Jesus. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Visit streetevangelization.com to get involved. 
The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. What have you always wanted to know about the Vatican? Well, I'm your Vatican Insider, and I answer that question when I bring you the news about the Pope, Vatican City, and I share insights and stories from a broad spectrum of church ministries. Vatican Insider with Joan Lewis, Saturday night, 9 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. Back to Catholic Answers Live. It's an open forum. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. It's an internet open forum, so all the questions have come to us via the internet. If you ever want to get in touch with us here at the show, just send an email to radio at catholic.com. And I know Jimmy's got a variety of ways, including uh, Jimmy, you can, people can get in touch with you through uh, mysterious.fm, right? Is there a. Yes. Is there, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah Jimmy, Jimmy, at Mysteri- Jimmy at mysterious.fm. Uh, or they can do jimmy at catholic.com. Uh, I generally, if people are wanting to ask an internet open forum question, I would suggest using Jimmy at Catholic.com because that helps it keep my workflow straighter and the right things in the right categories. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say they could send a pigeon, but I actually don't know how the pigeon things work. Like you, doesn't a pigeon like have to fly home? Like you can't just send a yep. pigeon to anyone. You can't like go to Jimmy's no, house. The way, the, the way homing pigeons work is you, you attach a message to the pigeon you from a location that's other than where the pigeon lives so let's say you're a let's say you're a, a in in a trench in world war 1 okay well the pigeon let's say lives in paris at headquarters but you're out here in a trench and you've got the pigeon with you you then tie a message to the pigeon let him go he'll go back home to paris to headquarters yeah, that's what I thought. and then at headquarters they can read the message yeah all right. Uh, yeah, so you would have to actually have pigeons that would fly home to you if I if people were to send you their message via pigeon. Yeah, and I've got squirrels, but I'm not interested in pigeons. <laughs> uh, the, I've never heard of a homing squirrel, although that would be awesome if there were homing squirrels. Mm-hmm. I have not heard of that. Rob wants to know this. At what point in attending an illicit or invalid mass should the laity speak up or choose not to receive communion? Okay, uh, technically no masses are invalid. What can be invalid is the consecration within the mass. And either if the consecration is invalid or if there's another major defect in the mass, it'll make it the mass illicit, meaning performed not in compliance with the law. Uh, So we got two questions here. Um, When should you not receive communion and when should you speak up? Well, one should not receive communion if one knows for a fact that the consecration was invalid. Um, so if you if you know it as an absolute fact, th- let's say, and, and this is very hard actually for people in the pews to know um, because, you know, they're, it's, the sacraments are like Tonka trucks. It's hard to break them. God made them that way since he knew we would screw things up. So he made it hard to screw up the sacraments in an invalidating way. But let's suppose you're in the, let's suppose you're in the pew and you see the priest has just forgotten to say the words of consecration. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that can happen. Priests, you know, lose their place, their mind wanders, they can forget to say the words of consecration. And unfortunately, it's not just them who can forget things. We could forget things too. He might have said the words and we just forgot it. Mm-hmm. But if that's not the case, if you were watching carefully and he just didn't say the words of consecration, then th- the elements have not been consecrated and you should not receive communion. Um, so that's the basic answer to that. If you know for a fact it's invalid, then you shouldn't receive. S- when to speak up is um, a harder matter that involves prudential judgment. In the ideal, one should speak up as soon as you realize that the consecration was, for a fact, invalid. Like you see the priest forgets the words of consecration, you could go, Father, don't forget the words of consecration. 
Yeah. You know, that would be the ideal, alerting him quickly. Maybe not by shouting, but by letting him know in one way or another quickly while the problem can still be addressed. On the other hand, there can be situations where, um, where you know, it could cause even bigger problems to do something like that. And in if it would, if... It, and it would cause bigger problems, you know, like l encourage a priest to desecrate the Eucharist at, at future masses or something. That would be a bigger problem um, then, than just accidentally omitting the words in this one mass. But if it would cause bigger problems, then it would justify being quiet for the moment and trying to deal with the situation afterwards, possibly involving the bishop if necessary. Uh, being quiet would have undesirable consequences. Um, some people who are present probably wouldn't realize the consecration was invalid, and they would erroneously think Jesus was present when in fact he was not. However, God does not hold people accountable for things they were innocently ignorant of. And so, hypothetically, there could be larger situations that would need to be dealt with in some cases, but such situations are rare, and the ideal is let the priest know as soon as you become aware, even if it's not by shouting from the pew. Um, you know, you could, for example, go up to the deacon and alert him or something like that. And then he could whisper to the priest what the issue is. Uh, but unless you uh, are sure, then you shouldn't be shouting from the pews. <laughs> you, gotta, you need to be sure that the consecration wasn't invalid in order to refrain from receiving, and you gotta be sure um, if you wanna take any kind of immediate in the moment action. Although if you're not sure, you can always raise questions later, but you shouldn't be you shouldn't be shouting from the pews. Uh, Rob, thanks for the question. On we go. This one comes from Mark. If God doesn't change, the God is simple argument. How does that square with Jesus gaining a human nature? Well, okay, this comes up periodically, and I'll answer it again this time. Um, but then I may take a break from this question for a while. The, uh, the answer is, in the eternal now, where his divinity is, God does not change. In the eternal now, God has always had a human nature that is found in time. And it be that human nature begins around the year 3 B.C., so if you're God in the eternal now and you're looking at history, you always see that you don't have a human nature prior to 3 BC, and you always do have a human nature in time beginning with 3 BC. And so that's how you are unchanging in, uh, in eternity, but Jesus could still change through time. Um, he, from an eternal perspective, there is no change. There is no incarnate Jesus before 3 BC. There is an incarnate Jesus after 3 BC. And that is always, both of those are always the case from an eternal perspective. Mark, thank you for the question. Uh, on we go with George's question. Uh, George asked this, I've heard people say that the hats that bishops wear symbolize their authority. Can you please expand on this? Well, I assume that George is referring to mitres, which are in the Latin tradition, are those kind of pointy hats that bishops wear. They kind of flare out and then flare back in and come to a point. Um, those are known as mitres, and it's true. They do symbolize the bishop's authority. If someone's wearing one of those, it tells you he's a bishop. So it's a sign of rank, just like, you know, in the, in the military, officers have different l numbers of stripes and things like that to indicate what rank they are. Well, in the clergy, they also can have headgear to tell you what their rank is. And if they're wearing a miter, that tells you they're a bishop. All right, George. Thanks for that one. This one comes from Joanne. What does it mean that the disciples didn't know Jesus till the breaking of the bread? Well, um, so I'll tell you my preferred solution. And then I'll tell you another one that I know some have proposed. My preferred solution, because it says that the two disciples' eyes were kept from recognizing Jesus. This is in Luke 24, if you want to look it up. Um, I. It sounds to me like they have what you could call induced 
prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia is otherwise known as face blindness. Um, prosopon is the Greek word for face, uh, and agnosia means not knowing. So if you have prosopagnosia, then you don't recognize somebody by their face. And that's consistent with what Luke says. He says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. It's like they otherwise would have recognized him, but there was an intervention miraculously that kept that process from happening. So it sounds to me like God has induced prosopagnosia in these two disciples. And so that's why I say induced prosopagnosia is my preferred solution here. And then when Jesus takes the bread and breaks it, it says their eyes were opened. And so that sounds like the induced prosopagnosia stopped and they could now recognize Jesus. Their brains were no longer failing to process the recognition of who he was. And it's like, oh, you're Jesus. I can see it now. So that's my preferred solution. I have, I am aware of others. Uh, one solution is Jesus had some kind of quirk about how he broke bread compared to other people. And that quirk in the breaking of bread, so like oh. he, he ripped the host a certain way or ripped the pita a certain way, that let them know he was Jesus. I find that implausible, though, uh, because the the text, when you read the text itself, um, it focuses on their eyes and, and on the processes happening with them. Their eyes were kept, and then their eyes were open. It doesn't focus on what Jesus is doing with his hands. And then you get la a later summary when they're relating it to the apostles after it's already happened. Luke says they related how they recognized him in the breaking of bread, but that doesn't mean the way he broke the bread. It just means during a meal, because every meal was a breaking of bread. So we were breaking bread with him, and that's when we recognized him. I think that's all that is likely to mean. Joanne, thank you. I'm, I'm moving uh, quick now because uh, we're getting near the end, and there's lots of great questions. Brian wanted to know this, Jimmy. Can any parameter of creation be infinite? Yes, I think so. Um, the future of creation is infinite. There's not going to be a stop to it. And so in, in my mind, if the future can be infinite, then the past could have also been infinite if God had chosen to create an infinite past. And if, uh, if the temporal dimensions of creation can be infinite, then the spatial dimensions could also be infinite. So God could, in my mind, create infinite space for creation and infinite time in both directions. We know he didn't do that for the past, but he could have if he chose. That's my view, but other people make arguments to the contrary. All right, Brian also asked this question. Uh, in what sense do unicorns exist or any other fantasy idea like orcs or dragons? Well, believe it or not, unicorns exist in multiple senses. There are several different types of unicorns that really do exist. Um, and we'll be having a two-part look at unicorns on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World in June, where we go through unicorn lore and then show you what in reality actually corresponds to that. We'll also be doing dragons in the future. Um, Basically, dragon legends seem to be based on dinosaur bones that people have been finding throughout history. But unicorns definitely do exist. Um, some of them are na naturally have one horn, and some of them artificially have one horn. But they are real, and there are several different types of them. Wait, unicorns are real? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, several types. All right. We'll have to look Both forward to that. Natural and artificial. We'll have to look, look forward to that in June. Uh, uh, Brian, oh, excuse me, Brett asked this. I have a hard time lear learning languages. I get the principles, but the memorizing of endings gets me. I'm better at reading and working it out than listening and translating by hearing. I desperately want to learn Greek for purposes of studying the Bible. What program, book, software, class, etc., would you recommend to someone who wants to learn biblical Greek? Okay, um, so one thing you can do if you have trouble memorizing endings is take a tip from Oops. Pimsler, which focuses on memorizing the ending of a word 
first before you memorize the rest of it. Also, um, I would recommend, since I don't have a lot of time, I would recommend Basics of Biblical Greek by Bill Mounts. And there's a selection of products that are all part of the Basics of Biblical Greek paradigm. But of the programs that currently exist, that's the one I'd recommend for a beginner uh, who's thanks. serious about learning it. Uh, thanks, Brett. Thanks to everybody who submitted questions. Uh, there's lots more, so I, we will get to do this again. Jimmy, thank you. I really enjoyed those two hours. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm glad we survived the um, this, the eclipse as well. All right. Uh, well, Darren, and thanks for the groovy music. I do appreciate that. We're, we're, we're done for today. We'll see you next time, God willing, right here. Oh, tomorrow's Weird Questions with the same Jimmy Aiken. See you then. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to this channel. I'm trying to grow it, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless.